Okay. Now, this will be a two-part series, actually. So I'm going to go through a two-part series. And uh, actually, you'll either hate this uh, message and not come back to the next Bible study if you'll hate this message, or you'll like it a lot. So it's either a love and hate message. That's what this teaching is. So I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, please. Jeremiah chapter 2. The reason why this is going to be a love and hate message is because the topic is something you're going to feel very, very convicted on. The topic will be on backsliding. Backsliding. Today we'll be talking about backsliding. And after this teaching, I'm going to convince every one of you that you're a backslider. All right. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 19. And uh, a lot of times when I say you, I hope you understand that there are times that it, in, that it does include me. When preachers or teachers uh, teach or preach hard, they don't do it just out of anger. They do it hard because a lot of times they're talking about themselves. So when they're very passionate about something, it's something that gets at them. They're talking about themselves quite often. All right. So I hope you get that one. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 19. Like I said, we're all in the same boat, and today I'll be talking about backsliding. Now, the doctrinal application is going to be to the nation of Israel. When you look at this chart here, it best demonstrates about the nation of Israel how they're constantly backsliding. So notice when they started out as a nation under their king, started good, but he backslid evil. David was a good character, but Solomon started out good, evil. Now look at the nation of Israel when it was divided. So we saw them united, but look at them divided. Every single one of them ended up evil. You see that? See that? Now when you look at Judah, they had some good people, but look at how many evil kings they had for Judah. A lot more. They have those who started out good, but then ended up evil. So you wonder why God finally gave up on the nation of Israel. He turned them over to the enemies because they just keep repeating a cycle and they just keep messing up. And that's what backsliding is referring to. It mostly refers to this nation of Israel, you're going to find out. And the best place to... The best books to read, if you want to learn about backsliding, is to go through the book of Judges and the book of Kings. When you read those books, and that can include Chronicles, you'll see a lot of yourselves here, and not only yourself, but even this nation that we live in. What men learn from history, church is what? Men yeah, men never learn from history. Uh, human nature is always the same, no matter how much you increase in education or technology. So there are two usages of backsliding. So that's the first part we're going to be covering in backsliding. There are two usages of backsliding. One is the doctrinal application. It is not referring to you Christians, believe it or not, doctrinally. The word backslide is actually referring doctrinally to the nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament. If you look at Jeremiah 2, verse 19, the Bible says... Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing. Now, if you look at that chart, notice evil, 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 evil everywhere. <laughs> and uh, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. I want you to look at how many times backsliding is mentioned. If you go to another one, chapter 5, verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6. Notice how many times Jeremiah mentions backsliding. Verse 6, the last part of the verse, because their transgressions are many and their backslidings are increased. Go to chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 5, verse 5. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding. 
Go to chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 7. Verse 7. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. Go to chapter 31. Chapter 31. Verse 22. Verse 22. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? Chapter 49. Chapter 49. Boy, that will be a great verse for ladies Bible study. Right? <laughs> chapter 49 and verse 4. Verse 4. Wherefore gloriest thou in the valleys, thy flowing valley, O backsliding daughter. Okay, so you see right here just in one book of the Bible alone how many times backsliding is used. And there is clearly, no doubt, it is a doctrinal reference to the nation of Israel. If you want other verses to write down, they are Hosea chapter 4, verse 16. Hosea chapter 4, verse 16. The two books that mention the word backsliding the most will be Jeremiah and Hosea. So if you ever want to do a study or a preaching on backsliding, I would highly recommend those two books. There's a lot of nuggets you can glean from there. Chapter 11 and verse 7. Chapter 11 and verse 7 is the next verse you want to write down. I'm not going to turn it and read it for time's sake. Chapter 14, verse 4. And chapter 14, verse 4 is the last one. Now, even though doctrinally backsliding is a word that is in reference to the nation of Israel, it doesn't mean that we cannot make any spiritual application out of it. We can practically call ourselves backsliders because an individual can do the backsliding according to the book of, go to Proverbs 14, Proverbs chapter 14, and then verse 14. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 14. Great verse and probably the only verse that you could use to show that this term can have a spiritual or a practical application toward an individual, not just the nation of Israel. Proverbs 14, 14, the Bible says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied. From himself. Now that's really good, that last part, all right? Uh, how you're going to gain satisfaction in Jesus Christ is when you're going to do it away from yourself. That's the best place. But people, when they want to satisfy, it's always on themselves, right? That's what they think satisfaction is. But imagine a satisfaction that you have that is not all about you. Man, that would be quite a dramatic change in your life. That would be real, genuine happiness. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you very much for that one. All right. Oh, come on. What's that? We'll change that. Okay, we'll do. Keep it on. Oh, what's it going? Not. Uh, would you like to keep the end on this session? All right. Thank you. The screen's backsliding too. You know, it. You can tell it doesn't like this teaching. It sure hates it. All right. Now go to Hosea four, verse sixteen. Hosea chapter four and verse sixteen. Okay, so we talked about the usage of backsliding, the doctrinal application, one, and then two, practical application. Doctrinal application to the nation of Israel and practical application to an individual. Now let's talk about the definition of backsliding. Definition of backsliding. Now, the, the definition itself is not hard to figure out. It's pretty simple. The definition of backsliding, and then we're going to look at the doctrinal use. It was referring to the nation of Israel, right? So, in the nation of Israel, originally the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, so I'm going to show you the Hebrew usage, including the English usage of it, and to show that there is an agreement of terms over here. Notice right here that, according to Strong's Concordance, we see that the definition means to turn away. It also shows a turning back, apostasy. So notice right here, it's just basically backtracking. 
That's the whole bottom line with backsliding. Now that gives a whole different meaning then toward backsliding, especially when you look at Hosea 4.16. Hosea 4.16. Now, uh, Pastor J. Jew probably preached the greatest sermon that I ever heard on backsliding. I don't know if he still has that old sermon. I don't know if he even remembers that. This was before I was a pastor. But he preached this sermon on backsliding. And if you know his style, which is hard, if you want to hear a sermon on backsliding that's hard, I would recommend Pastor Jeju on that one. Those of you watching us online, I'm sorry, I don't think it's online. Okay, I don't think you can find it. I don't know if he still has that sermon or if he remembers. But if he has that, that would be cool if he can preach that at our popcorn blowout. But anyway, Hosea chapter 4, uh, verse 16. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. So that's the text that Pastor Jew used. Basically, backsliding is just simply sliding back. He gave the illustration about, I'll never forget it, it really got me under conviction. He mentioned about a glass door. It doesn't matter how small you do it. The thing is, is as long as, uh, you know, when you open and close it, when you slide it back like that, even just a little bit, automatically you're backsliding. So it's, the definition itself is very simple, and we don't think about that. It just simply means to slide back. Sliding is very easy. When you're sliding off a sled, you're, and then let's say you're going to slide downhill, it just slides by itself. You don't have to do anything. A lot of Bible teachers talk about in order to backslide, you just do nothing. There are other quotes that says, uh, backsliding starts with a lack of prayer. Spurgeon mentioned, just do nothing in your life. Don't do any work for the Lord, and it's automatic. You will backslide. So in other words, the point is this. You don't have to sin. You don't have to do anything wrong. Just don't do anything for the Lord. Just be as you are. That's the whole bottom line. Just be as you are and see what happens after that. You backslide, guarantee. All right, go to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings 11. I told you you'll either hate or love this message. 1 Kings chapter 11. And we'll look at verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 11. And we'll look at verse 4. Another thing to notice about backsliding is that it's a turning away of the heart from God. So it's something that starts inwardly. It's something that starts inwardly. When you turn your heart away from God, you're automatically sliding back to sin. Can I repeat that again? When you turn away your heart from God, so there's that word of God. You're leaving it on your shelf again. And by using the excuse, I've got work, or using the excuse, my health is just not that good, Using the excuse, I'm just too tired, I'm just too stressed, I got a lot of things to do, I got to have my own me time, etc. I just got exams coming up, etc. When you turn your heart away from God, that's automatically sliding back to sin. Now, if you don't believe me, then you don't really pay attention to your behavioral patterns. You do know this, every time you turn your heart, heart away from God, you always sin. Now, go to... 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Notice right here, see, he went after sin. His heart went after other gods, even though the verse says his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. So is your heart perfect? I'm not saying right or good. Is it perfect with the Lord? If you don't think so, then there's something in there, some God in there. See, that's some sin in there. That's hindering your heart from going after God, but still clinging on to that idol. Does that make any sense? See, backsliding is a whole different meaning when you examine the scriptures. Go to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. So basically... What I proved to you from this teaching that every single one of you is a backslider. 
That's why we take this thing very seriously. And you think you can survive by skipping church, skipping Bible reading, skipping prayer? You know that you and I can't. When you skip, that's extremely dangerous because all of us already qualify as a backslider. So if you skip one of those things, do you know how the potential danger is increasing more? All right, let's go to Revelation 2, verse 3 through 5. 3 through 5. Notice the church of Ephesus that this is a backsliding church. Now, this church of Ephesus is like us. They're zealous in good works. They're exposing evil, wrong doctrine, and the lies of the world. And they're soul winning, and they know doctrine. But notice that this Bible-believing, King James-only, dispensational church is considered to be backsliding. And has born, verse 3, and has born, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labor, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou have, hast left thy first love. So they left their first love in spite of their good works at verse 3. Verse 3, look at that. They're a hard work in church. But verse 4, they left their first love. And notice, verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art what? That's backsliding. Like you're sliding back. You're sliding off the, sl uh, the slide again. Remember that? Remember that illustration I mentioned with Pastor Jew about the sliding door and if you just slide it back, then automatically that's backsliding. Why? Slide back. That's what it means. So if you move it even like 0.1 inch, you automatically meet that definition. You slid it back. Okay, go to Galatians 5, Galatians chapter 5. The English dictionary right here from Noah Webster, we see that a backslider, we see apostasy quite mentioned here, right? We saw how, according to Strong's definition, and even in Webster's, and if you look at a lot of other Bible teachers, they'll call it an apostate or apostasy. But we've also seen that backsliding doesn't have to mean a full-blown apostate church. You can be a Bible-believing, strong, zealous, spiritual church like the church of Ephesus, but they are backsliding somewhere. So that's important to understand. So yes, it is apostasy, but we see right here a second definition, not just the first one here. We see a second one, one who neglects vows of obedience and falls into sin. See that? So it shows a skipping here, something that's missing. That automatically qualifies as the definition for backsliding. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5. Now, this is the standard text that's used to make you doubt your salvation. A lot of people, they do not believe in the term a backsliding Christian. They think that a saved believer, that he should not backslide. And then they'll teach wrong doctrine, like lordship salvation, sinless perfection. Or that if you're really saved by faith, then there should be works out of your life. But this ignores reality. Reality is, no matter how spiritual you are, everybody backslides somewhere. So it is very possible, even for a very spiritual person, to backslide to the point of complete apostasy. Why? When you slide back, even if it's 0.1 inch, and you're very spiritual... Well, that person must be a saved person because he's done so much good works like the church of Ephesus. But see, sliding back never stops. They assume it stops somewhere. No, when you slide back, the natural law for anything is to keep going downhill. And there is no stopping point or limit to that. They assume that, well, if you're a really saved by faith Christian, then somewhere along the line, the Holy Spirit will stop you. No, it won't if you have the free choice to pick the flesh once and the flesh is an endless pit that doesn't say, let's stop right here with our sin. Doesn't do that. 
Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. And this is the text they'll use. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, notice in that verse, and then I'll show it to you in the big picture here. That way you all can follow along. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, this is a standard text used by heretics and those of wrong doctrine or those who don't believe once saved, always saved. They're going to try to show you that backsliding, there is no such thing as a backsliding Christian. If you are backsliding, if that's the way you want to call it, they'll accuse you for, if that's your term or that's what you want to call it, we see that more as falling from grace. See that? So if you're falling back, then you're falling out of salvation by grace. So see, you are not really saved by grace then. Because if you're really saved by grace, you shouldn't fall back. You shouldn't backslide. There should be significant works out of your life. Now, there's a problem with their claim, and it's, ev it's very easy. You just read the verse as it says, right? You just read the verse as it says. Christ is become of no effect. Okay, so Christ, that's our salvation, right? He has no effect of our salvation by grace. He will have nothing unto you whosoever of you are justified by the law. Oh. Now, you all already know the answer then. Yeah. Yeah. That's very easy. Any of you who believe in good works for salvation or rely on good works for salvation, justified by works, you're the one that fallen from grace. Now, that's the verse that is talking about those guys instead that says, if you're really saved by grace, then we should see good works out of your life. No, that verse says right there, those of you who insist works, you're the ones falling out of grace. Funny, isn't it? You see how the devil craftily uses some verses to deceive people? But the interpretation just comes out so plain when you read the verse as it says. So any of you who got justified by faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ, not by works, then guess what? You are saved by grace and you're not falling out of it. You are still saved by grace, once saved, always saved. And I'll even dare say that those who teach the wrong doctrine, well, if you're really saved by grace, we ought to see good works out of your life. If there was a point in time where you guys did not rely on your work, and you're honestly saying that, Okay, if you're honest about it. I did not really rely on my works for salvation, but only by faith and grace through Jesus Christ, then you're saved. Come on. But if at that point in your life of your salvation, you did rely on works, then you're not saved. You're fallen from grace. Yeah. Wow, so then, yeah, let me name names. So sorry, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, and John MacArthur, if at your salvation time you really had that in your mind about significant amount of works when you trusted in Christ for your salvation, you're not saved then. You're still headed for hell. But I'm not going to call you that because I, I take it for granted, which is very common, is that there was a point in time that many of these people truly, simply, just simply, they didn't know theology, okay? They didn't know all these doctrines. They just had a simple heart. I believe what Jesus did on the cross for me for my salvation. And I don't rely on church membership or my good works or all this. Amen. I take it for granted that they, they all did that. And I'll take it for granted that they just been deceived somewhere along the line by theology or some Calvinist or somebody out there who trained them wrong doctrine and they got brainwashed later on. That seems to be more realistic to me. And if you don't think so, and you're upset at me for saying that, then the, that's, that leaves only the other option then. Then you're still lost and headed for hell. <laughs> that's the only other option. <laughs> but let's, uh, so let's prefer that option that you just got to see by wrong doctrine. All right? That's probably the more likely explanation rather than you guys are being lost. Okay, let's go to... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
When the Bible talks about a Christian falling, you're going to notice right here the falling has to refer to falling back into sin, not falling out of grace. Let me repeat that again. When a saved believer is falling, when the Bible talks about backsliding or falling for a Christian, it's falling back into sin. It's not falling out of grace. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we'll look at verse 12. The Bible says, and it is possible that saved believers can fall. They can backslide. Verse 12, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So you have to keep on guard because if you don't keep on guard, you're going to fall. What is this falling? This falling has to do with verse 13, yielding to temptation. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Hence, we see right here from this passage, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the falling has to do with yielding into temptation and sin. So I displayed it over here. That way you can see the verse very plainly. That's why, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed. Why? Because the automatic rule, remember backsliding? I showed you the automatic rule. If you're not on guard, right? If you don't have a perfect walk with the Lord, if there's something missing there, if you're not standing somewhere, the automatic rule is, the natural law, remember, is to slide lest he fall. See that? So that verse warns you. Now, I would like to ask you this question. As soon as you wake up in the morning, is this verse, read, look at that verse, read that verse, is that verse what you have in mind when you wake up first thing in the morning? Is this verse popping up anywhere at all in the middle of the day for you? Before you go to bed at night, is this in your mind at all? No, right? If not, then you're not... If you never took time to think about where you're standing, then what happened? You are falling. Like I told you today, you'll either love or hate this message. This is probably the hardest you'll ever hear. But I just proved to you that every single one of you is a backslider. And remember that disclaimer, that includes yours truly, okay? So don't forget that. So don't be mad at me, all right? Now this has to do with temptation and this has to do with yielding into sin. So then we wonder why the temptation, we're not escaping. Now you understand why? Yeah, you're not doing that. See, you're not doing that. That's why you keep repeating the same old habit. Quite often, I hate myself when I'm repeating the same old mistakes that I do all the time. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. No, she won't, okay, so... I, I do it quite often, and the re what helps me immensely is to always keep in mind, practice verse 12 and 13, just practice verse 12 all the time, and then before some fight happens between me and my wife, or I mess up in my own same sin or mistake again, or somebody ex sees my weakness again, I have to keep that in mind first, and by doing that, I take guard, and then I prevent myself from falling. But if I don't think that, then I'm not taking guard, and the natural law is to... All right? Natural, natural, natural law. It's stronger than the law of science itself. Remember that. Stronger than the law of sowing and reaping, I would even say. This law of backsliding, natural tendency, is a guarantee if you don't take guard. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. It seems like we don't really understand backsliding, right? We need to go back to the basics. No, we don't need to know deeper doctrine, new stuff. We need to go back to the basics and see what we've missed to remind ourselves things that we've forgotten. Go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. 
the Bible says another good definition of backsliding. And because iniquity shall abound, so we see right here, this is backsliding, obviously. Sin is increasing. But this happens because the love of many shall wax cold. Now, this is a very good definition for backsliding. If you want to know that you're backsliding, the simple thing to know that you're backsliding is, are you feeling colder? Yeah, then something there you're backsliding then that means that verse says iniquity does increase iniquity abounds why something there that's increasing in in coldness so if you feel like your christian walk has been dead has not been on fire then there's a good chance you're backsliding all right that's why me i never lose my shout I never lose my shout. You see me shout back then and shouting today too, even if I'm the only one. Everywhere I go into different churches too, I never lose my shout. Different churches I go to, if I'm the only one on the altar, I'll go down. Ask my wife, I even drag her on the altar, you know, because I don't want to be the only sinner. I go, let's go. And she's like, oh, oh. <laughs> so I force her to repent. I'm such an awful husband. Yeah. <laughs> Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. Yeah, no comment. 2 Peter chapter 2. Hey, uh, in the middle of my preaching, you know, after preaching today, I might just grab one of you by the hand and drag you down on the altar. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. Now, there's a gradual process in backsliding. Uh, I like how this chart illustrates the life cycle of sin here. It gives it a, it's as much as a law, okay? Now, you'll notice that quite often I'll say that about backsliding. It's a law, it's a law, it's something natural. Why? Because the flesh is part of physical science, your body, material, is something that all atheists believe in. Now, when we're talking about the tendencies of your flesh, the behavioral patterns of your flesh, the sins of your flesh, isn't that consistent within hard science itself then? So I'm giving you natural hard scientific laws then. So backsliding is probably one of the strongest laws of science, or at least to me it is. Why? Because we're talking about your fleshly nature here, not your spiritual nature. So we're talking about your fleshly nature here. So when you hear me keep saying law, 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 then remember that. But in our Christian walk, we don't think of it as a law. We don't want to think about it at all. We think that we're okay with God. We always think that. You know what that is? That's fantasy. Yeah. You have no scientific hypothesis to support it. Now, when we go to the life cycle of sin, think of this as a law now, the natural tendency. I like how this uh, demonstrates it, and then we're going to look at the gradual process of sin, which is now the next section we're covering, and you're going to see similar traits right here. So it starts out with something you uh, love, desire. See that? There's something you like about sin. That's why Satan always makes the world very pretty to you. That's why the devil lies to you all the time through TV. TV always lies to you. The devil always lies to you when you see other people with their fake smiles and then comfortable lifestyles and make you think, man, isn't that a good life to have? See, it always starts out with desiring. You don't backslide because you don't want to. Let's, let me repeat that again. You don't backslide because you don't want to. You backslide because you want to. Oh, I hate this sin. I want victory in my life. I wish I could be holy. No, that's not really true. You do want to sin. <laughs> that's why you're still stuck in that addiction. It's that simple. You still love that sin. There's a desire there. All right. Yeah, everyone's going to come out discouraged after this lesson. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to come back to church after this. <laughs> and now, then it goes to deceit. It tricks you. It lies. I like how this person worded it. 
We give in to the lie that these are good or okay. Good. Typical liberal, right? <laughs> we make a choice to sin. This makes the entire difference here. And this is something that not even, the, that not even God will forcibly control. Yeah. This is something he allows you to do. You can only change your fate and your future. And that is choice. Choice is so powerful. That's why when you made that decision, you changed your whole life again, right? The choice you make will determine the rest of your day that you're going to be a happy person or a depressed person again, just by the decision you make. Then there's a detriment. The detriment is that it becomes habitual. It's a habit, even though it's harmful. And you know it, but it's habitual. You can't give it up. And you're locked in. You're stuck, so to speak. And then death. Then everything is the end for you, and there's no turning back the clock. You're reaping what you're sowing. Some of you are doing that. And then other people, it's just too late. You can't get some things back. There are just some marriages that are permanently ruined you can't go back to. There are just people, live, people's lives that you've hurt you can't go back to. Years you've already wasted in sin you can't go back to. So death. We're going to look at Lot's case. He's the best example of this. 2 Peter chapter 2, and then we'll look at verse 6. The Bible says... <clears throat> and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them, uh, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them <clears throat> in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds." The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now notice in verse 6, God is saying the story of Sodom and Gomorrah should be an example. Meaning then the Lord wants us to pay attention. Meaning then the Lord would like for me today to use this as an example for all of you to learn. Which is why I picked this as an example for all of us to learn. It's a perfect example of a saved Christian. You see there at verse 7 and 8 and 9, Lot is called righteous man. Lot is also called the godly. So there is no doubt he is a saved person. This does not mean that he lived a righteous life or a godly life. As a matter of fact, what you're going to see from his life, he pictures to a T everything about you and I today. Everything about you and I today. But God calls them righteous and godly. So this is a great example of a believer who is saved by God's grace, not by his own works. And during that time period where Lot, being a saved by grace believer, he was still backsliding. And it's an example for all of us to learn. So the standard chapter, Genesis 13. Genesis 13. There are so many sermons that come out from this passage of Lot. And I'm going to demonstrate some of the points to you. All right? So the points here, they're all going to start with C because these are adapted from some sermons that preachers have used. So the process of backsliding is very gradual and it starts with certain steps that will match some parts with the chart that you see. So we're going to go with Lot's life as an example of a backslider and it's a gradual process. Let's start with Genesis chapter 13 and verse 10. The Bible says, And Lot lifted up, what? His eyes. He's seeing something. And beheld all the plain of Jordan. See, there's that desire there, right? 
that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me tell you something. If you would not touch that marijuana, that drug, that sexual thing, or that wicked thing, if you saw how ugly it was. If someone sees poop, no one's going to touch poop. Do you understand? But you see it all prettied, nice, pleasurable. When you see it that way, that's why it grabs you, sin. Okay, when you look at the next part of verse 10, the verse says, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, isn't that interesting? So notice in verse 10, God may mention, before I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, I want you all to know, it was very pleasurable to see. It's a very comfortable lifestyle. It's something so beautiful, anyone would desire it. God made mention of that. I mean, the Lord even compared it at the next part of verse 10, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Can I say it this way? Sin will almost be like God's heaven to you. Otherwise, people won't keep messing around with sin like that. Can you imagine that? That's why uh, preachers, you've heard them say quite often, for believers, this life, uh, our life on earth is our hell. Our life hereafter is our heaven. But to the lost, this life on this earth is their heaven and the hereafter will be hell. Now, if this is their heaven, do you know how sad that kind of a life is? This world filled with sin, iniquity, pain, everything. So, we have to understand that. All right, let's go to verse 11, Genesis chapter 13. And then we'll look at verse 11. The Bible says, uh, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves from uh, the one from the other. Now, the next thing we see right here is choice. Choice. So in Genesis 13, 10, we saw covetousness. And then the second part we saw is choice. Now, Lot's choice, notice, was very, very low. We see in the chart right there, decision makes the entire difference. We see in this verse, 11, then Lot chose him, all the plain of Jordan. Instead of making more valuable, high choices, he chose the low things in life. I like how that verse said, then Lot chose him all the what? Plain of Jordan. See that? It's on a lower level there. Lot chose the low things in life. He didn't choose the high things, the important things, the things that do matter in life. When you think about that, sin or the things of this world are too low for you. So why do you decide on those things? Well, I want that future. I want that career. Too low. What are you wasting your life on? Uh, I want to date or marry that person. And, you know, uh, parents, a lot of times when they're opposed to that decision, it's because I know that sometimes they can be selfish, but other times it's because they're seeing a bigger picture. They're seeing high, they make too much high standards for you, right? Because my boy, my girl, you know, you're just not good enough for him or her. They put you on a high standard there. So a lot of times when you make your decisions, which is sad, and to be honestly saying this, there are people making low decisions in life with the people they date, with the people they marry. They don't look at a bigger picture. They don't look at the high standards there. Yeah, it's getting kind of quiet. And uh, the evidence is, look at the divorce rate. That shows their decision was poor. It was a low standard. It wasn't a high standard. But see, we choose the low things because we just want to gratify our flesh immediately. That's what we want to do. So that's how our flesh is built. It's too low of a decision. We don't choose the high, more valuable things in life. That's our choice. 
So when you decide something today, you have to think about, will this make a full difference? Is this a higher standard, a high valuable decision, or is this too low for me? You have to think about that. You have to think about that. Here's another thing about choice. It's not just choosing high valuable things. It's also rejecting. When you reject, you have to ask yourself, am I rejecting something that'll be permanently, that can permanently change my life for the good? That's huge. That's really huge. Every time you skip out your spiritual duty, Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, etc., or what God called you to do, but yet you're too stubborn to not submit under the will of God, you have to ask yourself, am I rejecting a high and lofty, valuable decision that can change my life forever for the rest of this day? So it's not just choosing the low things in life that will be a detriment to you later on, but more so than that, you're rejecting the high and lofty and valuable things that can be a betterment to you. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, 12 through 13, 12 through 13. The third point is compromise. The third point is compromise. Now, uh, let me write them all out here. The backsliding always goes by a process. We've seen that. This slope is always proven to be true, no matter how much your flesh tries to justify it. But the Lord is always right, and you'll always be wrong. We see here, first thing about it is covetousness. So let's review again. All right, you desire something. When you desire and when covetousness comes in, that means you're not happy with the current thing you have right now. See that? So the reason why people backslide is there's something that the Lord put in your life that you're not content with, that you're not happy with, that you can't stand to be with, and that verse is, uh, make sure that you stand. If you can't stand, then take heed lest you fall. So if I can't stand this, you know, this church, this life God has given to me, this path that he put me on, this, 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 then that's why it starts out with, oh, look at what the world got. They got it more comfortable. That seems to be a better option. That's a shortcut. I would like that. And there's where covetousness comes in. Always, all the time. That's the first step. Then when you do that, it comes to choice. And then the choice is, I'm going to pick a lower decision. And you reject the high and lofty one. You reject the more valuable choice. Uh, then you see right here, the third one, which uh, we're looking at. The verse points out, verse 12, compromise. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now notice right here, verse 13, Sodom is wicked and exceeding, but Lot is not in the land of Sodom. See that? So he's not the one living in wickedness exceedingly because he just pitched his tent towards Sodom. That's it. You notice that? He's not living in Sodom. Later on, we do find out he did. But he's not living in Sodom. All he does is, I know that's wicked and that's exceeding. I shouldn't sin. I shouldn't do that bad thing. I know that. I know my Christian walk. You know, I have my spiritual convictions. You got yours. So I know my limits. You don't know my limits. So let me do what I think is best for me. And I'm not in Sodom. I'm just pitching my tent that's facing towards Sodom. That's it. 
When you have your tent door flap facing towards Sodom, then every time you open that tent flap and go out in the morning, you see, wow, man, that Golden Gate Bridge in Sodom is so beautiful. I saw that advertisement from Gavin Newsom, and he said, come to California. I hate Florida over here, and they have more equal rights there. And man, th those city lights are so beautiful in San Francisco. And I heard that they're so happy over there because CNN displayed it all the time. And man, such happy people there. Wow, what? And then when you get in there, then you realize the trash that's in there, and then you can't wait to move out. Anyway, although I'm mixing up with humor and exaggeration, there is a lot of truth in there. The point is that every time, first thing in the morning, that's all you see, then you're going to end up in there. So, you, so the best thing was you never should have had your tent flat facing towards Sodom to begin with. Instead, it should have been facing toward Abram where he's at. Instead, your tent should be where God wants you to be. Instead... Where you should be facing toward is that you should be face to face with Christ your Savior into his word. But you compromised with sin. Even though you're not quite into it, you just move closer to it. And notice right here that you're sliding back already. That means you're back sliding. You're not wicked, you're exceeding, but hey, if you put one foot into the mud, you might as well call yourself dirty, even though you're not all in. We're going to look at the fourth point, look at chapter 14, chapter 14. So we see right here, the third thing is compromise. Compromise. So ask yourself this question, are you compromising with sin? Are there things that you have in your home that you allowed? Things in your technology devices? Things that you've been hiding that you allowed to keep it there? People you hung around with, which you won't do publicly in church, but you hang around with and you use the excuse it's because of a better working relationship. It's because of a, I need to lead them to Christ's salvation. It's because, uh, well, I would hate them if I just, and they would think I'm weird or I'm too holier than thou if I get away from them. And you, you see that? You compromising with sin? Next thing you got to look at is capture. All right, look at chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 11. The Bible says here, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Oh, now, now he's living in Sodom. See that? But notice he got captured by the enemy. Has your enemy caught you? Yeah, he caught you, didn't he? One living near sin will be captured by sin. As I told you before, if you got your foot in the mud, if that mud is quicksand, it caught you already. So you will get sucked in. What does that mean? That, as, that is a law then. That is a law. When your foot is outside of the building's roof and you're leaning toward that way, law, you fall. Same thing, you put your foot into that quicksand of sin, law is you fall. In other words, you're captured by the fall. And you wonder why you can't get victory, you can't get out of it, because you compromised. So it automatically captured you. You know why you keep compromising? Because likely chance is you're probably not in that third stage compromise. You're probably already in the fourth. You're captured. That's why you keep compromising. You're captured already by it. All right, let's look at chapter 19. Chapter 19 and verse 1. Chapter 19 and verse 1. The next thing that we want to cover is carnality. Carnality. Paul Washer says there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Hogwash. He doesn't know what he's talking about. 
He's just carnal for saying that. He doesn't know reality. Carnality is where you blend yourself so much with the world now. You're living in Sodom. And then what happens is there's hesitation to leave it. You know why you're hesitating to give up those things? Because you're not in the stage of compromise. You're in the stage of carnality. That's why. So you're already blended in. You became one with it. And you're hesitating to leave it. Because, remember, you love it so much. You might think that you're in the first stage, but how do you not know you're in this stage? That's what backsliding does. Backsliding blinds you so much, you don't know what stage or level of sin you're in. That's good. Don't worry, today's teaching will be harder than the next preaching, all right? At least next preaching won't be as mean or as hard. First time a Bible study is just that hard, right? And you want altar call. All right, Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. Notice right here, the Bible says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And then verse... So notice he's sitting at the gate of Sodom. He's involved in official council duty here. Verse 16, And while he lingered... See that? He's hesitating. The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. So God, out of great mercy, dragged him away out of the city of Sodom so he doesn't get burned up. But notice that Lot was hesitating, even though the judgment of God was coming. You, you know what? You get an example of people today. People today, even though you know the judgment of God is coming for you, you still hesitate to leave it. All right, let's look at Genesis 19.8. Genesis 19.8. Uh, the next part is cripple, cripple. The verse says, Behold, now I have two daughters which have not no man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now, did you hear what he said? Here are these wicked Sodomites who are coming in to injure the angels, but then the Lot, but Lot he offers his two daughters instead. Now, you know what happened? He got crippled right here, spiritually, that he lost his morality. All right, let's look at verse 14. And Lot went out, verse 14, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. You know how crippled he was spiritually? Not just so much that he lost his morality, but even any spiritual deed he attempts for the Lord is crippled. You know why some of you are struggling with your Bible reading and prayer? You've been crippled by playing with sin. So that's why Bible reading and prayer is such a struggle for you. It's you feel like a cripple. Some of you, it takes a lot of effort to go to church. You know why? You're already crippled because of what you messed around for years in sin. The lifestyle you're used to, that comfort, that plane of carnality. That's why your soul winning is so weak. It's not because, well, I'm too stupid. I don't know apologetics like Pastor Kim does. No, no, it's, it, the simple answer is, is because you've been so crippled by the flesh and sin. Yeah. So you're soul winning. That's why it's not being effective with your loved ones now. Lot became so weak that he was willing to let the sodomite injure his daughters. And he was so weak that his soul winning didn't even convict in spite of his sincerity. Did you hear that? In spite of his sincerity. I want to get right... I, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of you can understand. We live in a very carnal culture here. So I know this happens to a lot of us. Is that when you are sincere, you love the Lord, you want to give him the glory, and you have a passion for the Lord, I see that. But then, it's hard, isn't it? 
It's genuinely hard for you. And then when you look at other Bible-believing churches that you see or you visit, you're like, wow, they just serve God and they seem to do it better than we do. Why is that? Why is that? Because you're crippled by this culture. That's why I mentioned a few times when I talk to some of you laborers how I'm very upset about this culture. Yeah, because it's a very carnal culture we're used to. So it crippled us in our labors, in our basic labors for the Lord, in our basic volunteer sheet, in our basic church attendance, so basic. That's why everybody has to follow up on each other. Everybody has to encourage each other. Everybody has to be very patient. And yes, that now includes your kids. Your kids get crippled. Because why? The parents, you parents are crippled. That's why now, uh, okay, uh, anyway, uh, I'm preaching, so stop, stop, stop. Ah, ah, let's finish. Okay, I'm past the time. Cave, 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 cave. All right, Genesis 19, Genesis 19. Like I told you before, if uh, some of you didn't hear the beginning, I just want to give that disclaimer. At the beginning of this teaching, I, I mentioned this was going to be a very, very hard teaching because the topic is backsliding. And backsliding is not just a full-grown apostate wicked person. Backsliding literally means just to slide back. You ever seen a sliding door? If you slide it just back, even just 0.1 inch, see, that's backsliding. And the tendency is when it slides down from a slide, it's natural. It just keeps on going. There's no stop. So that's why this teaching is very, very hard right here. All right, so let's look at verse 33, verse 33. And don't worry, the preaching will be much lighter than this teaching, all right? All right, verse 33. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Now, that is just disgusting and messed up. 35, 36, 37, 38, his daughters uh, sleep uh, with the father in the cave. So Lot's life caved at the end. He's at the that's so to speak. He caved at the end. He's at the end of his rope. And here he is living the rest of his life trying to drown his sorrows in, in liquor and just uh, sleeping with his daughters. Now, that's sad. And that shows the chart that I mentioned to you, death. Now, I'll tell you one thing. The reason why all of you, and, my, and when I say all of you, remember... Like I gave that disclaimer at the beginning, I'm including myself, right? The reason why all of you, including myself, are, are like right at this stage, right? Ugh. And we, we're encouraged to be there is because we didn't hit this yet. We didn't hit that yet. The reason why you and me, it's so easy to do this and this and this, and we're so encouraged to do all this, and you wonder why can't we just start right at the, po at the top here, is because we, we're always looking at this, and we didn't hit that yet. Because we never hit that yet, we're, we're so encouraged to stay in any of these levels. Every head bow, every eye shut, altar calls open. <laughs> Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, as I continue part two of this teaching next Sunday, I pray that uh, this part one will be kept in our minds, that it was a blessing rather than an offense, rather than a burden to the people here. Uh, this teaching had to be taught. The reason why is it's part of our studies. You said backsliding so many times in the Bible. How can I avoid this topic? So I have to at least teach it once. I pray that this teaching at this uh, particular day where we probably heard, the, heard something very hard, that it will be a blessing, that we'll apply it, that we won't mess up our lives in it, that we'll take it seriously and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.